this morning, uh, we are going to cover some things here. And I want to, let's see where we're at here. Yep. Okay. <clears throat> Actually, if you want to, you can grab your Bible. If I can do this without making everything fall. And we are going to go to, first we're going to go to Matthew, Matthew chapter 7. Matthew chapter 7. Now, uh, as if you were with us during the first session this morning, we went through the laws of spiritual growth in law number 5, which was the law of vision. And now we're going to go ahead and cover law number 6, which is the law of execution. The law of execution. It could also be called the law of action. And so we're going to look at that. Now, in all of these, uh, these are all vital to spiritual growth. Without any one of these, you will not grow spiritually uh, to the degree that God wants you to grow. Now, you can just show up at church and hear some preaching and it'll do some good and, you know, there'll be some growth. But it won't be the type of growth that, that God desires in you because your growth should be consistent. It should be progressive. It should be uh, very um, accelerated would be another way to say it. All right. Now, so we're talking about the law of execution. Now, the law of execution simply means this, the law of action, like I said. And it literally means that you must do something. You must do something. This is where we lose most people, to be honest with you. This is where most people uh, don't proceed far, farther. And if you remember during the, um, well, yeah, whenever I taught on the secrets of spiritual power, the seventh secret of spiritual power is action. And it is also a law of growth. There must be action. Now, as we said, even from the very beginning of these laws of spiritual growth, it's just like going to a gym. And, uh, you know, it's just like physical growth. The spiritual growth is very much like spiritual growth. What that means is that you must have, you know, several things involved. Uh, for instance, uh, there are elements involved in growth, which is if you're going to exercise and get stronger physically, there has to be actual exercise. That means you actually have to exert energy, uh, which usually means there has to be some type of resistance going against you. There also has to be nutrition. You have to have, when I say nutrition, everybody has nutrition. It's just everybody's nutrition isn't nutritious. And so uh, you have to have the right kind of nutrition. You have to have good nutrition if you want the body to grow. Same thing with your spiritual growth. And then, of course, you have to have rest. And it is actually during the rest See, during the exercise part, during the action part, is where the body is torn apart, you might say. You know, it, it's broken down. Then with proper nutrition, the nutrition is there to help rebuild the body, and the body actually rebuilds during the rest period. And so all three are essential. Proper nutrition, proper exercise, proper rest. Those three have to be there. Now, these go and fit in with all of the laws of spiritual growth as we're talking about. And in the area of execution or action, there must be some type of action. Now, I could go into so many different ways on this, you know, go, go off into different areas. Because every, if you're going to, I'm going to try to keep it limited to just spiritual growth. But you will see that in spiritual growth, your faith has to grow. In spiritual growth, your peace has to grow. And in every one of these, you need the three essentials of exercise, rest, and nutrition. And so for you to grow in these areas, you're going to see a consistency really in every area. What that means is this. If you're going to grow in peace, then in which peace is a fruit of the Spirit, so it has to be grown and developed. And if you're going to do that, then you actually have to have rest, nutrition, and exercise or resistance action uh, to cause that area to grow. But then you have to go right on over into the next area of love, which is another fruit of the spirit. And you have to have the proper nutrition, exercise, and rest to grow in that area. So as you, you take each one of these areas and you apply these three principles. Now, when you do that, you will have consistent growth. And it's actually during the rest period, like I said, that the growth actually takes place. And it's funny because you can work out, you can do all these things physically, and then there's a point while you rest and while you're usually sleeping that all of a sudden the growth takes place. It's, it's in a 
a split second type of thing that the actual growth actually starts to repair and take place. So it's really pretty amazing. Um, now, in that, I'm going to show you the principles and the scriptures, and I'm going to take you through uh, the law of execution or the law of action. Okay. Now, um, so let's go first to Matthew chapter 7. Hopefully you found it by now. Matthew chapter 7. And we're going to start around verse, let's see. We will start around verse 24. Yeah, around verse 24. And there Jesus is, is speaking. And we know Matthew 5, 6, and 7. This is the uh, Sermon on the Mount, right? As most people would call it. And this was a... Uh, he broke this into several different pieces, or man has, you might say, and we're going to do that to analyze this. But in uh, Matthew chapter 7, verse 24, Jesus says, and this is amazing that he would speak this. You have to remember, people didn't know who he was. To them, he was a rabbi. And they didn't, I mean, they were starting to see him as a prophet, maybe by this time, maybe starting to see some of it. But overall, when you read the words he said, this is heavy. I mean, this is so strong because he says in verse 24, whoever hears these sayings of mine and does them. You hear that? Whoever hears them and does them, not just hears them, not just hears them, not uh, talks about them, not, uh, you know, says how great they are and oh, how wonderful words fell from the lips of the master as we've heard it said and all these different things. That, that isn't it. He said, whoever hears them and does them. So there has to be action on the words you hear. Now, see, that's one of the problems that we have today. We've got a lot of people that profess but don't actually do. And so, and they think that just professing is enough. But Jesus made it very clear right here, so let's read it. He says, matter of fact, just before this, up in verse 21, he says, not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, shall enter into the kingdom of heaven. But he who does, acts, does the will of my Father who is in heaven. So see, it's not just saying it. It's not just praying a prayer. It's not just signing a card. It's not even just mentally agreeing with doctrines. There has to be an action. See, we are to put these things in our life. That would be very similar, and you've probably heard this before. It'd be similar to me saying, man, you know, I really want to develop a, uh, you know, a championship uh, bodybuilder body. I really want to develop that. And so I'm going to read every book. I'm going to watch every video. I'm going to go on YouTube and I'm going to watch it. And, and I'm going to, oh yeah, I see these exercises and I know that, you know, to develop, a, to be a bodybuilder, uh, you've got to do this exercise and that exercise and you have to have this much rest. You have to have this kind of nutrition and we can stand and talk about it all day. But if all I ever do is read about it, watch it on YouTube and talk about it, guess what? There's going to be no growth, no change because nothing changes Till you do. Now, what I mean by that is nothing's going to change in your life until you change how you live your life. And that's the purpose of the scriptures is to tell us how we are to live. There was even the question one time, how then shall we live? And so uh, we need to realize that we are to live according to the word of God, meaning doing what it says. Now, so we're going to go through several of these, but he says here, uh, whoever hears these things of mine and does them, I will liken him to a wise man who built his house on a rock. And the rain descended, the floods came, the winds blew and beat upon that house. And it did not fall, for it was founded on a rock. And everyone who hears these things of mine and does not do them will be likened to a foolish man who built his house on the sand. And the rain descended, the floods came, the winds blew and beat on that house and it fell. And its fall was great. Now, notice, then it says, when Jesus finished these sayings, the people were astonished at his teaching, for he taught them as one having authority and not as the scribes. In other words, he was, I mean, can you imagine that? Here, you imagine if you came and I was preaching to you and I said, listen, uh, if you hear my words, if you hear what I'm saying, but you don't do them, your life is going to fall apart. Now, scripturally, uh, biblically, I have every right to say that as long as what I'm saying is Bible. But you have to remember these people were, they had other rabbis. Uh, they, you know, we look at Jesus a different way than how they looked at him at that time. 
And here was this rabbi sitting there telling them, you've got to obey my words. I mean, that's, that's almost blasphemous because that was putting his words on the level with the word of God, which, as we know, they were on that level. But the people then had to take it by faith. They had to be able to listen and say, wow, wait, this guy says, if I don't obey his words, my life is going to fall apart. Think about that. that would you have made that commitment at that point? Oh, oh, yeah, I would have done it. Well, you know, maybe, maybe not. Who knows? Uh, because you weren't there. But the fact is, there has to be a change. He did not say, he that hears my words and agrees with them. No, he said, he that hears my words and does them. Now, see, people, well, brother, you're talking about works. You better believe I am. Yes, I am. Why? Because your faith has to have works to produce you have faith or to prove you have faith. People say, well, you know, I, I have faith. Well, that's what James said. James said people would say that. I have faith, you know, but he said, well, I show you my faith by my works. I don't just tell you. Listen, we're going to talk about this today, and I'm going to try to keep it reasonable length here. But I want you to get the scripture first, and we'll come back to it, because this is vital. Without this, none of the other laws will work in your life. So you have to get this down. Now, uh, the next one that we want to go to is, of course, James, which a lot of people don't like the book of James, amazingly. Because they, um, they, they don't want to do anything. That's, that's why. And they want God uh, to do everything for them. And they're just going to sit back and do nothing and just give lip service. Which Jesus talked about people who gave lip service to God. Uh, but didn't uh, actually get their heart near him. And actually because when your heart's near him. You're actually going to live the way you say you believe. But he said these people draw nigh me with their lips. But their heart is far from me. Now, in James chapter 1, in verse 22, it says, therefore, it tells us, do not be deceived. And he tells us not to deceive ourselves. He says, be doers of the word, not hearers only, deceiving your own selves. You know, he didn't even say the devil deceived you. He said, you deceive yourself if you hear and don't do. You know what? I'm going to say this, and it's probably going to you know, get me some flack over it, but I'm kind of used to that. Um, you know, it's amazing. It would be better for some people to just stop going to church. Just stop going. Just don't go. Why? Because you just keep heaping more and more judgment and condemnation on yourself because you keep going and hearing and not doing anything that the preacher says. It'd be better for you just to stay home because at least then you're just responsible for what little bit maybe you've heard because God knows if you're not going to do the word, I don't know why you'd pick up the Bible during the week and read it because it's not going to do you any good unless it just placates that religious part of you, uh, which is not godly and it's, it's not that the, the spiritual part. So you're going to have to decide at some point, you know what? This book either means what it, what it says or it doesn't. And if it means what it says, then you're supposed to live by it. If you're not, just, you know, go be a Buddhist. Go be a Scientologist or something else. You know, go be a self-help somebody. Why? Because this book is not about reading. It's not, it's not just about comforting. It's about change. It's about transformation. See, that's why the church is so much like the world. Why? Because they actually don't do what they read. They, and they don't do what they hear preached. And so there comes a point where you actually have to start doing what it says for you to take it. You know, I was kind of jokingly said in times past, you know, I mean, I, I believe in good nutrition. I don't practice it, but I believe in it. You know, I mean, it's, it's out there. I know it exists. Um, and the closest I usually get to it has been supplements and things like that. And it's funny because I'll go on a trip and I'll take a, you know, little thing with my supplements in it. And it's so funny because the schedule on the road is so hectic and it's, it's you know, it, well, it's an excuse to not actually take the supplements. And I've jokingly said that the best uh, benefit I get from taking supplements on the road with me is the exercise of lifting the bag and carrying it from the car to the hotel room because I don't take them a lot of times when I'm on the road. Sometimes I do, sometimes I don't. But those, those vitamins and nutritional supplements, they don't do any good sitting in the little bottles or sitting in whatever the canisters or whatever it is. They don't do you any good like that. You actually have to take them in. You have to actually ingest it and let it assimilate into your body. Well, guess what? That's exactly like this book right here called the Bible. You have to ingest it and you have to let it assimilate into your body, which means it starts to change things. And then you'll start doing things differently. And so that's the purpose. There has to be action. I can't, you know... <laughs> 
<clears throat> this is where a little bit of patent comes out at times. You know, you sometimes want to slap people and slap some sense into them and go, look, straighten up, quit being stupid. You say, well, you can't call me stupid. No, Jesus said you're a fool. I didn't say you're a fool. I said you're stupid, right? Why? If you don't do his words. So I, I, sometimes I'd love to just shake some people and go, look, just start doing what you already know. People come to me all the time. What do I need to do here? What do I need to do? And you know what? When I tell them a scripture and I say, here, do this. You know what they say? Oh, I know that scripture. Don't tell on yourself. Go do the scripture. You know, <laughs> it, it is amazing how many people just want this word. You know, it, it's like as if, why don't you just take this book, put it under your pillow, and just lay your head on it and hopefully you'll get it by osmosis. That's about how much good it does to go to church and hear preaching and then not do it. So, because it doesn't just seep out through the pages. You actually have to ingest this. You have to make a decision to follow it and do it and live it. And guess what? When you make that decision, the enemy comes immediately to try to steal that word. Why? Because he doesn't want you to change. Why? Because as long as you stay the same, you're a billboard for him. And trying to get people, in the, oh, oh, praise the Lord. Uh, how are you doing? Oh, blessed and highly favored. Really, is that why your life is such a wreck? Does that look blessed and highly favored? Well, you got the words down. Why don't you get the actions down? You get the actions down, guess what? The words will mean something. That's why a lot of people don't even listen to what you say because your words don't mean anything. They hear you say one thing and they see you live another way. And they, don't, they said, it's not working for him. Why would I want to do it? So there has to be that where you actually start doing what the word says. Now, a couple more, a couple more scriptures. Go with me to Luke. Luke, and we're going to go to Luke chapter 9, Luke chapter 9, and we're going to start in verse, if I can get there myself, verse 57, yeah, verse 57, Luke 9, 57, as they went along the way, a man said to him, Lord, I will follow you wherever you go, well, see, that's, that's, Kind of like walking down the aisle or raising your hand. You know, every head bowed and every eye closed, cowards. Anyway, um, I'm just saying, listen, that, that stuff, that doesn't even work in church, let alone it's not going to work out in the street. At some point, you have to hold your head up and go, you know what? I follow Jesus. Well, well, you can't say the name of Jesus. Watch me, Jesus. There we go. We're going to say it whether you like it or not. Amen. Why? Because we're going to stand by this, right? And you say, well, 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 we'll punish you for that. Take your best shot. You know, the worst you can do is put me where I'm trying to get. That's the worst you can do. So it's a win for me. So anyway, Luke chapter 9 and verse 57. He said, Lord, I'll follow you wherever you go. Jesus said to him, foxes have holes and birds of the air have nests, but the son of man has no place to lay his head. He said to another man, now look, notice what he said, follow me. He said to another man, notice he didn't give his name, right? They're being polite. They didn't want to embarrass him, right? And have his name written down. For all eternity, it is written down, but regardless, it's not in the book. He said to another man, follow me. Isn't that the same thing he said to the 12? So he was calling to a discipleship, to a, a life of discipleship. But the man said, Lord, let me first go and bury my father. It sounds like a reasonable request. You know, let me go bury my father. Now, we don't know, and I know there's some that say that the uh, Hebrew tradition was this man was probably still alive and well and doing good. He wasn't dying. Uh, most of us would think maybe this guy was on his deathbed. It doesn't say that because the, basically what they, some people would say this means is that in the Hebrew mind, uh, the man could not leave his family until his father had died. And that could have been years off. This man could still be in, in good health and all that. Uh, so, we, you know, it would make more sense understanding that. Then he said, Jesus said to him, leave the dead to bury their own dead. But you go and preach the kingdom of God. This man was being called to discipleship, called to ministry. Think about that, by Jesus himself. And he said, well, first let me go bury my dad. In other words, in other words um, listen, the kingdom isn't that important to me. Let me follow tradition. Let me follow the social norm. Okay, let me let me follow the social norm because uh, for, let me give it let me bring it home today. Okay, uh, the Bible says lay hands on the sick, but social norm says keep six foot distance. You decide what you're going to follow, right? It's just that simple. And and people, well, and it, it is amazing the level of fear that is in the church, not not the world. I mean, you'd expect it in the world, but the church. Come on, it's time for the church to actually grow up and get some courage, get some faith, right? All this faith talk that everybody's been doing and faith preaching, 
that people have been paying money to these preachers to teach them faith. And then the first thing that comes along, which lo and behold, guess what? There's a new uh, thing. Uh, one of the top medical doctors now has come out and said, guess what? There is going to be another pandemic. There's going to be another one. He said, mark my words, there is going to be another one. That's, that's what these doctors say. How much more advanced notice does the church need? At some point, get ready, folks. Stuff is coming. Get ready for it. Are, we, are you going to act the same way you did this time? Shut your doors, run and hide, keep people at a distance, not see your relatives, watch them die in a nursing home you can't even get to, uh, wait months, uh, can't even go to a funeral? Really? At some point, you're going to have to get some guts, some grit, and actually say, no, this is where we stand. And we stand on God's word. And it's just that simple. Now, he says here, you go and preach the kingdom of God. Yet another said, Lord, I will follow you. Now, he, now you got to volunteer. I, hey, I'll follow you. If that guy don't want to go, I'll follow you. Right? And he said, but first, let me first go bid farewell to those in my house. I'm, I'm just going to run home and say goodbye. And I will, I'll be right back with you. Now, that even sounds more reasonable. I mean, come on. You, you think... He wouldn't give him the right to say goodbye to his family. I mean, wouldn't even go back home. What would everybody think? Where'd he go? I don't know. He went to see a preacher, never came home. What would you think about that? But he says, now watch, this man just said, let me just go tell him bye. Jesus said to him, no one, okay, no one. Do, do, you, do you understand what no one means? See, I looked up word no one in the Greek, and it means no one, no one. That's what it means, all right? Who puts his hand to the plow and looks back, at things, now notice, is fit for the kingdom of God. Now that's what Jesus said. That's, that's in red, right? If you have a red letter Bible, that's what Jesus said. So you need to re realize if you put your hand to the plow and look back, you are not fit for the kingdom of God. Now you can, you know, you, if you want to go the, the way of modern Christianity and the way of hyper grace and the way of all this other stuff, which nothing matters anymore, which I don't know why you would, because if that's true, nothing matters anymore. Why do anything? So, but if you want to go that way, then go that way. Just, you know, don't uh, embarrass Jesus by claiming to be a Christian, right? Uh, because he wasn't embarrassed to be called our brothers, you know, our brother. Uh, and he wasn't embarrassed to call us his brethren. Well, guess what? To be his brethren, you've got to act like his brethren. So now, next one I want to take you to. Let's go, let's go to Luke chapter 14, right there in the same book. Just a couple of pages over. Luke chapter 14. And we will go to verse 25. We'll start in verse 25. It says, large crowds went with him. And he turned and said to them, to them who? The large crowd. That means everybody. See, some people say, well, I'm a believer. I, I, I'm saved. I'm, I'm a Christian, right? I'm saved. I'm a Christian. And I'm a believer. But, but this disciple thing. So I'm not a disciple because that was only for a special select few. And then, of course, after the disciples, then you've got, you know, the apostles or you've got the fivefold ministry. Well, I'm, I'm not that. I'm just a, a believer. I'm just a, a, a Christian. No, no, no. You have to understand, in God's understanding of things, the believer is the big guy. The, the believer is the one that all the promises are to. There's no promise to an apostle. There's no promise to a prophet. There's only promises to believers. And so we need to realize that we are believers. Now, I guess... The Apostle Paul did have a promise that he would stand before kings, uh, and he did, in chains. And so, you know, there was it, but that was the only promise, but that's not your promise. So, now, notice here, in verse, uh, we started verse 25, he said, it says, large crowds went with him, and he turned and said to them, if anyone, anyone, comes to me and does not hate his father and mother and wife and children, and brothers, and sisters, yes, and even his own life. He cannot be my disciple. Now, see, that's another passage. Maybe, maybe you didn't know that was there. You know, I always said I'm not going to bring uh, scriptures that are, you know, foreign to you. But uh, there are a lot of scriptures people don't preach on anymore, and that's one of them. So maybe you hadn't heard it before. But if you haven't, you heard it today. And what you're hearing is this. If you don't hate mother, father, brothers, sisters, wife, all these things, uh, children, even children, all of these and even your own life, then you cannot be his disciple. See, th that requirement for discipleship has not changed. Jesus never said, remember that thing I said about that? No, I, I'm pulling that back. We don't, that's too tight. You don't, you, you know, that's too, too rough. Uh, we're going to pull it back. He, didn't, he never did that. So we need to realize that's still uh, a requirement. 
And when it says hate, now you have to understand, it doesn't mean walk around with a hateful attitude toward a person. What it means is simply this. It's very simple. All it means is if you, you cannot let anyone make you make a decision different from what Jesus said. Now see, because what, what that means is this, that if you don't hate them, now, and again, this is not an attitude of hate like we normally think of it. What, see, in the, in the Hebrew mindset, there was love and hate, and really not an in-between. I mean, there was, it was one or the other. And what it literally means, though, is you, all Jesus was saying is, you have to love me more than you do them, which means you listen to me. If I tell you to do A, and they tell you to do B, then if you love me, you will do A, right? It's just that simple. And so he's not talking about being, having a bad attitude toward people. He's just saying, don't let anybody be so important in your life that you will listen to what they say over what I say. Bottom line, that's all it means. Just take that little segment right there, that little definition, and use that, because that's what that literally means. Now, now notice he says, and verse 27, and whoever does not bear his cross and follow me cannot be my disciple. Now, you hear that? Whoever does not bear his cross. In other words, that means you know, I, I love what Leonard Ravenhill uh, said one time, he said, one thing you knew about a man carrying a cross out of town, he wasn't coming back. See, that's what we have to realize. We have to burn our bridges. We have to burn our ships, as the saying goes, and we have to have nothing to look back to. We have to decide this is our future. You know, I, I, back in the day, I wrote Leonard Ravenhill. Actually, we were in communication uh, over a couple of years, and I wrote him several letters and he actually wrote back. I was really surprised. But he actually wrote back. And so I asked him about some of the things about intercessory prayer and about some of the different aspects, even of holiness and true holiness, and even of revival and what that meant. And I'm telling you, I go back over those letters from time to time. And it was amazing. You know, I wish to God that we still had men like Leonard Ravenhill around and people like Steve Hill and people like this that preached just, I mean, just preached straight from heaven. You know, just had that. Even I was thinking about Dr. Sumrall, uh, just as a matter of fact, this morning. And uh, I was recently told that basically his ministry doesn't exist anymore. And so it's sad because that's, it, it only took 25 years, literally 25 years uh, from Dr. Sumrall's death for all of that he, had, that he had built for it to die out. So it took 25 years from the time he died for it to die. That's a sad thing. That is so sad. Um, but he says here in verse 28, for who among you, intending to build a tower, does not sit down first and count the cost to see whether he has resources to complete it? Do you, do you see this? Jesus is talking about following him. And he says, you have to count the cost. He didn't say, just come on in. I'll make it all good. I'll fix it all up. It'll be great. You'll get employee of the month every month from now on. I mean, things are going to be great. I'm going to make your life just so perfect and peaceful and calm. It's going to be wonderful. Jesus never said that. He said, you can expect tribulation. You can expect persecution. He said, your greatest enemies will be those of your own household. I mean, think about that. He said that people are going to kill each other over this message. He said, you think I, I came to bring peace? He said, I didn't come to bring peace. Peace, I came to bring a sword. And that sword is going to divide, and it divides families. See, this is the Jesus you don't ever hear about anymore. The Jesus that says, you know what? It's my way or the highway. Bottom line, see, we don't like that. We, we like to be what we would think of as democratic, you know, having a democracy. We get a right to vote in this thing. No, no, no. You understand, kingdoms don't have votes. Jesus' kingdom, he's king. What he says is the only vote that matters. And you will either get in line with that vote or you'll go to another kingdom that you used to be in uh, that's darkness and gnashing of teeth and all that kind of stuff. So it's just real simple. You have to do his words or he doesn't know you. Simple as that. Now, so there has to be action. There has to be action in what you say you believe, right? Now, next. Um, yeah, I'm going I'm to keep reading this real quick. He says, otherwise, verse 29, otherwise, perhaps after he has laid the foundation and is not able to complete it, all who see it will begin to mock him, saying this man began to build and was not able to complete it. Or white king going to wage war against another king, does not sit down first and take counsel whether he is able with 10,000 to meet him who comes against him with 20,000. 
Otherwise, while the other is yet at a distance, he sends a delegation and requests conditions of peace. So likewise, any of you who does not forsake all that he has cannot be my disciple. It's just that simple, right? Now, what that means is your life has to change. There has to be action to change because, as I said, nothing changes till you do. Now, uh, a couple of more things here. I want to go through very quickly. Now, remember, we talked about this, the, the law of action, you might say, in Secrets of Spiritual Power. And it was the seventh one. It was the last one. So there has to be some type of action taking place. Now, I want to I shift gears a little bit. Not a whole lot, but a little bit. Um, and I'm going, you, you can turn to Hebrews chapter 11. I'm not going to read the whole chapter. I'm just going to hit some spots in it, you might say. But um, when I turn 40, I'll, I'll be 62 in about five days, something like that, on, on Thursday. I'll be 62 years old. When I remember... When I was 40, when I turned 40, uh, I remember telling my wife, I said, I am not going to turn 70 sitting in a rocking chair on my front porch wondering what if. I said, I, I, I'm not going to do that. I'm going to what? See, I, I, was, I was picturing myself sitting there at 70 rocking and going, huh, what if I just stepped out? What if the Bible was true and when I did it, it worked? What if there was action behind my faith, so to speak? And so I told her, I said, I'm not going to turn 70 sitting in a rocking chair on my front porch wondering what if. And bless God, you know what? I started doing what I was learning. I started putting it into practice. And I started going out. I started ministering to people. And I started trying things, the things that I was learning. I just started doing and acting like it was true because it was true. And I knew it was true. I just had never experienced it. But I had to step out to experience it. See, otherwise, it's all just theory. And so I had to step out. And so I stepped out. And honestly, just like Dr. Summerall, he eventually I went up to Dr. Summerall. And, you know, he said, uh, faith is real simple. It's just putting one foot in front of the other and never stopping. And that's what we did. We just started and never stopped. That's, that's the key. See, that's what you've got to get a hold of. You've got to start. You've got to move. There has to be movement. There has to be motion, action. You know, as we would say, faith is motion activated. So you can have all the faith in the world, but until you do something, it's not activated. It's not released. You won't see any difference until you actually start to step out and do something. Now, and in Hebrews 11, I'm just going to run through these real quick. Uh, starting about uh, number four, verse four. By faith, Abel offered. That means he did something, okay? Uh, verse five. By faith, Enoch was taken to heaven. Okay, now it says because he walked with God. So there was an action prior to him being taken. In number seven, verse seven, by faith, Noah, being divinely warned about things not yet seen, moved, moved. Get that? Noah moved. He did something. See, that's what you're going to see. If you go through this, all of these people did something. Do you realize the only reason you read about Smith Wigglesworth, about John Lake, about Amy Simple McPherson, or any of these people, the only reason you do it is because they did something. That's the only thing that separates them from you is that they actually read the Bible, believed it, did it. Most people just read it and sit back, and they're, they're satisfied reading testimonies of somebody else's. I got fed up hearing other people's testimonies. I, and I said, you know what? I need some testimonies of my own. And so I went out and got some. That's what I did. I just started moving, started, and, and I moved into action, and I started doing things. And so when you read these, you're, this whole book is testimonies of people who did something. Some people did the right things. Some people did the wrong things. And th their lives are right there to be read about. But they, the reason we read about them is because they did something. I can't get this out strong enough. That these people, the only reason that they're in the book is because they did something. And if you're going to ever be in the book, you're going to have to do something. And so you're going to have to actually start doing what you say you believe. Now, I just want to run through these real quick because there's a couple other things I do want to get you to. Um, yep, I do want to get there. So, um, you know, friends, I'm just, I just grabbed these off our book table, our uh, book room. Uh, this was by Dr. Sumrall, Bitten by Devils. This was a, the story about a young girl that was demon-possessed in Manila, Philippines. And Dr. Sumrall turned on the radio one day, and it was a news broadcast, and they were all, it was going live from the uh, Manila Police Department, from the jail. And it was talking about this girl and what was happening and Dr. Summerall heard about it 
and they didn't know what was going on uh, in, the, in the jail, but this girl was demon-possessed. And so Dr. Summerall heard about it and then ended up, and it took a couple of days, but he ended up getting permission to go in and pray for her. And when he went and prayed for her, he ended up getting her delivered. Eventually, they more or less, uh, well, they didn't adopt her, but she was uh, released to their custody so that they could, you know, keep her straight, you might say. She was a young prostitute and had gotten demon-possessed uh, in the process of being a prostitute. And some crazy things happen if you read this. But you know why this book is here? Do you, you know why he wrote that? Because he did something about it. He didn't sit and listen to the radio and go, oh, that's terrible. Oh, that poor girl. Well, I'll pray for her. Lord, help her. He didn't do that. He went. He got up. He went down there, and he cast that thing out of her. And so he actually did something. That's why you read this book. It's because it's a testimony of something he did. In um, this, John Lake's Writings from Africa. You know why you read this? Because it talks about what he did while he was there. It talks about the testimonies. It talks about the plague that he stopped and by believing God. It doesn't even say he prayed to stop the plague. He believed God. And so there's all of these uh, testimonies, demons cast out, healings taking place. And guess what? We read it because he did something. He didn't just sit and talk about it. That's the whole problem. We got too many people that talk and don't do. And so another one, Pioneers of Faith by Dr. Summerall. All of these people did something. That's why we read about them. I'm, I'm going to keep repeating it till you get it. They did something. But see, we can't be set. Listen, I, man, I love reading the testimonies. I love reading them. And, and they inspire me and they urge me to go further. Uh, I've been reading a lot of uh, John Alexander Dowie recently. And, uh, you know, he didn't finish the best. But that doesn't negate the work that he did and all that he did for the kingdom uh, during while he was strong and, and right on with God, as we would say. And, but it's amazing because I read his testimonies and I read his life and the things that he did. And it spurs me on. It encourages me, makes me want to, you know, I sit back and think, man, we ain't done nothing yet. You know, I remember Dr. Sumrall when he came back, uh, at one point he'd given his church to, uh, here in America, over to another pastor. And then he went, I think, to Israel and went to, well, he went to the Manila in the Philippines at first. And then when he came back, he was 50 years old. And the man said, Sumrall, one of the, another preacher, came to him and said, Sumrall, you're 50 and you're finished. And Sumrall got mad and said, I'm not finished. I hadn't even started yet. And so then, and he did most of the amazing things he did, honestly, from 50 on, planting the great churches, planting the different things that's going on. It's just been amazing what he has done. You know, the thing is this, every church, and listen carefully, every church he planted everywhere in the world, except the church that he pastored at the end, right, when he, when he passed. Every one of those churches are still going, and they're stronger and better today than they were when he left them. Every one of them. But the, the church that he turned over to his kids, guess what? It died. Why? Because there's something about people that get a hold of a message and run with it. And it doesn't necessarily go down through the family genealogy. Why? Because many times the children didn't have to fight their way up. They didn't have to fight the devil. And they were just, they, they, they were able to walk in some of the blessings and they didn't get the grit. And so we need to realize you need that grit, but the grit comes with action. Why? Because action produces resistance. The devil doesn't care what you do, uh, what you believe, put it that way. He only cares when you start to do something with what you believe. When you do that, then he comes against you. You can sit and, oh, and pray and, and, you know, and confess things and, and just agree and have a great time and just do all your soaking and all that kind of stuff and just have a, you know, a, a little praise party. You can do that all day long. The devil doesn't even wake up. Why? Because you're not a threat. But whenever you start to actually start to do what the Bible says, you get his attention. That's where resistance comes from, and that's where growth comes from. But it comes through action. So you know what? If, if, if the person who recruited you into the kingdom of God didn't tell you you were entering a war, I'm sorry he didn't tell you. I'm sorry he lied to you, got you in however he did. But the truth is you need to realize when you said, I make Jesus Lord, which most people don't even say that, they say, Jesus, please be my Savior, but whenever you come into the kingdom, you come into war. And you have to realize that whatever you're going to be doing, you're going to be matched and, and, or faced with resistance. And you have to decide. Now, when you're faced with, with resistance, then you have to come up with this. This is what Dr. Sumrall, I'm not trying to sell you these books. I don't care about that. I'm just telling you, this was a man who lived what he believed. And he wrote a book called I Did Not Quit. He kept moving forward. He kept moving forward. He never stopped. He never backed up. He wouldn't, the man, I mean, see, 
you think some of these people, you read about them and you think, oh, they, they're, you know, very eccentric and they, they, they're kind of strange and kind of weird. Yeah, because you're not used to people that walk by faith. Why? Because you don't walk in it half the time. Why? Because you're, you'd rather walk in the natural carnal mind. Well, you know, but brother, there's wisdom. I wear a mask because, you know, I care about other people. Really? If you care about other people, go lay hands on them with some faith and get them healed. Right? And if they argue with you, do it anyway. Get them healed and walk off. And so, but people, well, you know, brother, but don't you care? And people try to shame you into it. Don't you care about other people? Uh, I care about following him. And to the degree I follow him, I care about other people. But believe me, if I quit following him, I don't care about people. And that's, to, that's every human's heart. And so to, to really care about people, you got to follow him. And to follow him, you got to do what he said. Because if you hear his words and don't do them, he doesn't know you. You got to realize that. So we, we have to get to where we don't quit. One last book I'll tell you about. Adventuring with Christ, again, by Dr. Sumrall. Why? Adventuring. You know what adventure is? It's going. It's doing. It's experiencing life, you might say. And he was adventuring with Christ. He was doing something. You know, I, <laughs> one of the mottos that I like is that life is either an adventure or nothing. And it's why? Because there has to be that advancement. That There has to be that action taking place. Now, you know... Um, like I said, all these people did something. And they all, they, they read, they believed, and the, the testimonies, uh, you know, we overcome by the blood of the Lamb and by the word of our testimony. Now, not the, now listen, you, your testimony has to be real. It has to be something that you experienced. But experience doesn't come by sitting and reading. Experience comes by reading and doing. He that hears and does hears and does. See, it's like an epoxy that the two have to mix. And when you have hearing mixed with doing, then in the middle of that is faith and it comes to pass. And so there has to be that action. As long as you're just hearing, you're just a theoretician and honestly your words don't have the ring of truth to them. And they have no conviction behind them. They have no basis, no strength, no power. And you have to realize that there comes a point where you have to act on what you say you believe. Now, this is the, the, the sixth law, you might say, the law of execution. You know, uh, we talked in the last session about the law of vision. You have to have a vision, and a vision has goals. A vision is a plan. It's, it's goals, and you have goals along these lines. Well, if you don't have the law of execution, you'll never execute the plan, the vision, and you'll never be who God intended you to be. He made you like he wants you to be, but then now, you have to renew your mind and cause your body to be submitted so that you can actually do and become fully spirit, soul, and body who God intended you to be. Beloved, you know, I could, I could, I could stay here and keep saying these same words over and over again for a couple of hours just to drill it home. But you're going to have to realize you've got to do Today, make, make a plan. Write it down. Write the vision. Make it plain, the Bible says. Write it down. This, I, I've read this. This is what the Bible says. I'm going to do this today. Start with a small step if you need to. Whatever it is, just start. Just get started. Uh, start, and don't worry about the outcome at this point. Just go become obedient. When you're obedient and you do it right, the outcome will be guaranteed. But you, you just have to start, and you start by becoming obedient. Don't worry about the result before you are concerned about being obedient. Results will never happen until you're obedient. So there has to be that first. Now, uh, before we go here, I'm going to pray for you, and then I'm going to ask them to play a video because there's a, this is just a section uh, of a video, and I just want you to see this because, honestly, this is where I'm at. You know, this is... Um, and it's where you have to get to. Like I said with Dr. Sumrall, the thing about Dr. Sumrall is he would never back up. If he left something behind, he wouldn't go back and get it. He would, somebody else would have to get it and bring it to him because he, he saw that as backing up. See, and like I said, you say, well, that's just weird. No, there's a principle in it that, that you have to get a hold of that, okay, that's a principle. I will never retreat. I will never back down. I will never back up. I will only move forward. And when you get that in you to that degree, then you will only move forward. But as long as you allow for failure, as long as you allow to, well, sometimes you got to back up. The, no. And it's like I was talking about the other day, uh, this morning. 
that, you know, the family of demons, daddy demon, mama demon, and baby demon. You know, we're going to talk about that in, de in detail, but I will tell you, a baby demon grows up to be a big demon. And I will show you how he will grow up if you, if you allow him to do it. And it's up to you to decide that he ain't going to grow. And so it's just that simple. But you have to make up in your mind that I have nothing else. I have nowhere to go. I have no backup. I don't have a plan B. There's only plan A. And you keep moving. Now, that means that there's going to be times when you have to get people out of your life that keep trying to throw plan C, D, E, F, and G in your way and try to say, you know, do this, this, this. Nope, only plan A. Why? Because God is with me. And like we said before, when you can see the invisible, you can do the impossible. But the people that don't see the invisible will keep telling you that what you're doing is impossible. But you just keep doing the impossible. And if you keep believing God and moving forward and putting action to your faith, it will come to pass. Don't quit. Don't stop. Don't back up. Don't quit. Don't never give in. Just keep moving forward. So right now I'm going to pray. So Father, I thank you. Your word is absolutely true and it is truth. And in the name of Jesus right now, right now we speak life and healing to every person under the sound of my voice. Whether they're hearing it today or five years from now on a recording, people will be healed right now. Why? Because there is power in words of truth. There is power by the Spirit of God. And right now, in the name of Jesus, I say, be healed. Be free. Be made whole right now. Now, right now, right now, you heard me. I just gave the command. The power is there. Now, so that's the faith. Now we need the action. Get up and do something. Do what you couldn't do before. Whatever it was you couldn't do, get up and do it right now. And shove it in Satan's face and say, take that. And then stand and keep doing whatever it is that they told you you couldn't do. But do it right now in Jesus' name. Now, right now, if you've not made Jesus Lord of your life, do it now. Don't wait. Don't wait to, well, you know, I've got to get my life straight. No, you can't straighten your life up. Coming to him is getting your life straight. And then he'll fix it from there as you work with him. But you make him Lord of your life. He's already died. He's already died for your sins. So show him your appreciation and your gratitude and make him Lord. That means you hear and do the words he said. That means you take up your cross and follow David. That's what all this means is you become a disciple of Jesus Christ. It is that simple. Now, right now, begin to just know what you need to do to take the next step. So right now, we say in the name of Jesus, we bless you. And if there, we can be of any assistance to you, let us know. And we look forward to helping you and meeting you and hearing your testimony because your testimony is going to inspire others to step out further in God. So in Jesus' name, God bless. Now, we're going to play that video for you, and I'm going to go ahead and say goodbye. We'll see you next time, and just go ahead and watch the video. God bless. No, sir! The I ain't going to quit! All right, then you can forget it. You're out! Don't you do it! Don't you! I got nowhere else to go! I got nowhere else to go. I got nothing else.